Welcome. This is Brian Wood, Medical Director for the Mountain West AETC Project ECHO Telehealth Program. Each of our weekly sessions starts with a short talk focused on issues relevant to HIV clinical medicine. The following talk was recorded live here at University of Washington. We will now take you to this week's talk. Thank you very much. I'm going to talk about the guidelines. I struggled a bit with how to present these. I tried to figure out a way that will make this a little bit more interesting and relevant. And so I ended up putting together a slide set that compares our two sets of guidelines, the IAS USA guidelines, the new ones that came out this week, as well as the HHS CDC guidelines. And I'm really going to try to focus on where the two differ. My disclosures are, or the disclosures, are that only FTC TDF, brand name Truvada, FTC TF, brand name Discovi, and the injectable cabotegravir or cabotegravir long-acting brand name Apertude are approved. That should be the last time I mention brand names. And we are, of course, going to talk about some off-label use of at least one of these medicines. This is the dis echo disclaimer. So jumping right in, and you're going to see most of my slides, again, there's still a lot of text and I apologize for that, are going to be laid out in the same way. So talking about showing in this left column or middle column, the new guidelines and their recommendation compared to the HHS CDC guidelines from 20, end of 2021. These have been in revision, but as we talked about the last time we're on that um, Don Smith unfortunately recently passed away and we are uncertain how these guidelines or when they're going to move forward. So this is what we have right now to work with. So the first thing we're going to talk about is who should be prescribed PrEP. And the main thing here is that the IAS USA guidelines now recommend that you talk to all sexually active adults and adolescents and people with substance use disorders and basically talk about PrEP with everyone to get away from the idea that we should be doing risk-based screening. I was just looking at a thread on Twitter about risk-based screening and we should, their feeling and many people's feeling is that we should be stopped talking about risk because um, talking about risk can be stigmatizing. People may not be aware there that they are at risk. And so obviously certain populations like African-Americans may have lower levels of quote unquote risk compared to white MSM for men of sex with men for comparison. So talking about risk may be something that we're going to leave or at least a little bit in the past. Uh, past. They, however, specifically encourage consideration of PrEP for people who are men who have sex with men or transgender persons who have sex with men. That is my abbreviation that I've used, not theirs. For young adults and adolescents, for individuals who have sex partners who come from places where there are generalized epidemics, for people who exchange sex for money or other things, for people whose sex partners are incarcerated or anyone with a recent bacterial STI. And I just want to contrast this with the, the CDC HHS position, which is that everyone should receive information, but that really PrEP should be recommended for folks who have substantial ongoing risk. There's a risk calculator that's been associated with these guidelines, and they focus on individuals with HIV positive sex partners, anyone who's had a bacterial sexually transmitted infection in the last six months, or anyone with inconsistent condom use. So one difference in philosophy between these two sets of guidelines. There was a comment in the new IAS USA guidelines around adolescents, and I just thought this was interesting that they included this specifically. There hasn't been a mention of this in any of the past guidelines of either set, that prescription of PrEP for adolescents should be done with attention to support and their adherence needs. We've known through all the studies that adolescents and young adults have more challenges with adherence and with persistence to PrEP, but also this comment that there should be care, that there isn't inadvertent disclosure of sexual behaviors and gender identity to parents or guardians. I just thought this was interesting. It's not that we're people who prescribe to adolescents or young adults who are on their parents' insurance aren't thinking about this, but this is the first time it has appeared in the guidelines. What to prescribe is pretty similar. In terms of the three medicines we have, which is FTC TDF, FTC TAF, oral medicines, or the injectable cabotegravir. So 
FTC TDF is indicated for all folks who are at risk for HIV acquisition, whether their risk is from sexual or injection exposures. Both guidelines recommend preferring FTC TAF if someone's estimated creatinine clearance is between 30 to 60. There is a slight difference in the recommendations for who FTC TAF can be prescribed for. The guidelines say that it is anyone who is not at risk for vaginal or neovaginal, it actually says exclusively for vaginal sex. The HHS CDC guidelines are consistent with what I've heard from many providers that they would prescribe FTC TAF for cisgender men and transgender women who have sex with men and not prescribe for anyone who even though they may be at risk from only rectal sex, if they have any chance of vaginal or frontal or neovaginal sex, that they would prescribe, uh, prefer to prescribe FTC TDF. Whereas the IAS USA guidelines are more open and more embracing of anybody as long as their risks aren't exclusive injection drug use and aren't exclusive receptive vaginal or neovaginal sex. Um, and similarly, they have a, a sort of a broader view of who is eligible for CAB. Uh, the CDC guidelines, again, which were written prior to FDA approval, say that it is indicated only for persons who are at risk for HIV infection from sexual exposures. But there's a comment in the new IAS USA guidelines that if someone is a person who injects drugs, who has sexual risk for HIV infection, that that person could be eligible for receiving PrEP via cabotegravir, even if they are also at risk from their injection practices. And we do not have information about whether CAB is effective in preventing HIV through injection practices, although most people would assume that it is. And then the other comment that comes out here, and these guidelines are very pro-CAB, as you might expect from the folks who are on these guidelines committee, is that the optimal PrEP regimen for a given person is the one most acceptable to that person and congruent with their sexual behavior, ability to take medications, reliable likelihood of anticipating sexual activity or an adverse effect profile. So the idea that we shouldn't be telling folks which PrEP medications they should be on, whereas the HHS CDC guidelines, again, written prior to approval, were that you could use all of these medicines, but that most people should remain on FTC TDF for their PrEP. So I just thought a very interesting difference in philosophy of how, who and what PrEP should be prescribed. There's a slight difference in 211 or event-based dosing, again, used only with FTC TDF. That's the only medicine that's been studied in event-based or 211 dosing. The IAS USA guidelines recommend this for cisgender men of all sexual orientations, as well as a new recommendation for uh, use in transgender women receiving hormone therapy where they say to prescribe with caution and insufficient data in all other populations, whereas the HHS CDC guidelines really explicitly say that this can be prescribed off-label for adult men who have sex with men who have sex less than one time a week and can anticipate sex. Baseline testing. Just gonna, this complicated, I put everything in here to be complete, so if I, I didn't want to leave out kidney function testing, um, because you'll go, oh, kidney function testing isn't recommended anymore. No, it's still recommended. It's just pretty similar between the two. So let me point out where the differences are between them. I, I know we've talked a lot about HIV testing over the course of the last year. So at baseline, both guidelines recommend doing an HIV test within a week of starting PrEP, ideally a lab-based test, and both say that it is sufficient to start PrEP based on the results of a point-of-care test as long as a laboratory-based antigen antibody test is sent off for further testing. As you've heard, the CDC guidelines are explicit about not using oral fluid testing. I don't know if that is going to stay in the uh, future guidelines. It's where the HIV RNA testing, of course, is, um, is a new thing. 
RNA testing is specifically recommended in the new IAS USA guidelines if anybody has a high risk exposure in the last four weeks, if they have signs or symptoms of acute HIV infection or for cabotegravir, as we've talked about in the past. They don't necessarily, I'm going to skip down to two, they don't recommend checking cholesterol or a lipid panel, which is recommended for people starting FTCTAF in the CDC guidelines. There's a lot of convoluted stuff about hepatitis testing. I think things haven't really changed that we should be screening individuals starting PrEP, regardless of what PrEP modality they are starting on for hepatitis, just because it's prevalent in the populations who are at risk for HIV. They're not specified in the PrEP part of the guidelines for in the CDC, but they are as part of primary care. And there's really no, no other differences between STI screening and pregnancy testing. For monitoring, this is where things are really quite different. So the recommendations for how to prescribe PrEP in the IAS USA guidelines is they specifically call out for a one-month visit for everyone with HIV testing, and then for three-month follow-up after that for people on oral PrEP, for people who are receiving injectable cabotegravir, or they'll start their two-month injection. So cab is initially administered as an initial one, and then the second injection is at one month. So that one month is consistent for everybody now. They do not recommend RNA testing in monitoring for folks on oral prep, like there has been a lot of controversy that we've talked about in the past with the CDC guidelines. And in contrast to the CDC guidelines, the IAS US guidelines recommend RNA testing for individuals on CAB every four months, every other injection, in contrast to the CDC guidelines that want HIV testing with every injection. The other follow-up is pretty similar. There is slightly, again, no uh, follow-up for cholesterol. They recommend follow-up hepatitis C screening beyond the primary care recommendations um, for folks who inject drugs who are recommended to have an annual screening for hepatitis C, and then pretty similar STI and pregnancy testing. There's no real differences in the oral lead-in other than there's now specifically in the new IAS USA guidelines, they recommend doing an oral CAB lead-in with people with severe atypy, atopic histories, or anybody with concerns. The tail recommendation is pretty similar. This recommendation about time to protection is, again, in the 2022 guidelines. It was in the 2020 IAS USA guidelines, which is very different than what's in CDC. So the IAS USA guidelines have really come out in support of the 211 dosing. So two doses for cisgender men who have sex with men, two to 24 hours prior to sex. And so based on that evidence, they have said that for cisgender men who have sex with men, that that they should, even when starting daily prep, they should start with two pills and that they are protected within 24 hours. For everyone else other than cisgender men, men who have sex with men, they specify that seven days of daily prep should be sufficient. And then similarly, they use the tail from 2 on one to talk about how long do you need to continue prep if you are going to discontinue prep? How long do you continue it after your last exposure? Whereas the CDC guidelines have been silent on this other than saying that the time to maximum drug levels is seven days for rectal exposures. Um, and 20 days for systemically. I'm going to skip this slide in for time. This just comments on what I said earlier that uh, the IAS USA guidelines recommend only a 30-day prescription to start. They really talk about emphasizing starting PrEP immediately, that there's no indications for delaying PrEP. They don't even seem to indicate that you should delay PrEP for signs and symptoms of acute HIV infection which I'm sure they didn't actually mean, but the statement is that delaying PrEP is not recommended, whereas this table that I've included that I'm not going to go for, which is straight from the CDC guidelines, is all the times where same-day PrEP might be appropriate and same-day PrEP is not. So the IAS USA, start PrEP on everybody as soon as possible, whereas the CDC recommendations try to bring in a little bit more caution. This is not to compare. This is just some from the new IAS USA guidelines. 
about some strategies for adherence support. And I include this because I thought it was interesting that they included stuff for CAB for how to ensure that someone can come in for on-time injections because there is a window of only one week around the time that they are eligible to get that next injection. So reminders, of course, but the programs that are implementing CAB may also want to implement transportation support or even home visiting nursing services, which is an interesting thought. Then finally, I just wanted to bring back both of these guidelines recommend if someone needs post-exposure prophylaxis, they have not been on, on any PrEP, that you should initiate PEP when appropriate and then seamlessly start them on PrEP. 28 days of PEP, three medicines, and then seamlessly to PrEP. What was interesting in the 2020 guidelines is that they specified when people are non-adherent to PrEP, when you should use PEP, so when you should increase to that third drug and give someone a 28 day course if they've been prescribed PrEP. And in the 2020 guidelines, they actually specified for men of sex with men and transgender women that if you haven't had on average four doses in the last few weeks, that you should start PEP. For all other populations, it's if you haven't taken at least six doses in the last week, then you should start PEP. But they are completely silent on this. And I just want to share it because I think it's really helpful for folks to help decide when should I write for PEP in this person who has been on PrEP. And on the right is the CDC. So report a sporadic adherence or didn't it take it in the last week. So a, a lot broader definition, sort of more, fewer people would be on PEP according to the CDC. Anyway, all guidance, not in the current guidance. And then I believe this is my last slide. Uh, Brian talked a little bit about this the last time I heard him speak. You all may have talked about this more, is that now after PrEP failure in any individual with prior CAB, that is what's in the new IAS guidelines, so prior, no how many years prior, that um, genotyping for the integrase inhibitors should be sent prior to starting an integrase-based regimen. And then if you're going to start a regimen, as we should when someone is diagnosed, that a, a boosted PI-based regimen should be used, but that after oral prep, this, um, and they use TXF and XTC to refer to any of the current tenofovir and either lamivudine or emtricitabine-based regimens, plus either dolutegavir or BIC for oral prep. So just, again, reinforcing the idea that in someone who has been on CAB, that CAB mutations can persist for a while and that they should have genotyping and another regimen until you get those results back and then you can adjust. But they comment, just as with prior guidelines, that anyone who fails oral prep should be able to uh, suppress even if they have some drug resistance. This is truly my last slide. There are new sections about a small paragraph around doxy post-exposure prophylaxis, an expanding section on COVID-19, an MPOC section, interestingly, a quite a large section on substance use disorders in folks who are HIV negative and positive, of which the main goal is that for anybody being seen for either HIV care or prevention should be screened for substance use disorders and referred. And then there is now a big section on equity. Thank you for watching this edition of the Mountain West AETC Project Echo Didactic Series. If you like this talk, please click the red subscribe button and please check out other talks in our series. Until next time, this is Brian Wood, Medical Director, signing off.